Welcome back. We're going to get our unit on peers in adolescent psychology. Um, in this uh, unit, we're going to look at three things in this first half. In the second half, we're going to look more at cliques and let's say uh, peer, uh, something more like the um, the Breakfast Club and things of that sort, where the the interaction between different peer groups among uh, adolescents. But uh, in this uh, video lecture, we're going to look mostly what uh, has changed to make adolescent peers more important than they were in the past. Uh, we're going to look a little bit at the debate of our, whether peers are a positive or negative influence on individual adolescents. And last, we're going to look at one particular group of kids, uh, latchkey kids, um, and see if they differ from other adolescents, and particularly because latchkey kids um, have less of a connection to their parents, and therefore there's less parental authority to see you know, whether uh, how the peers factor into that equation. So with that being said, let's begin. So I'm going to look at three large things that changed in the history of society over the last hundred years that have made adolescent peers much more important. The first is the age grading in education, and I'll explain what that means. Um, it mostly means that we put uh, students into uh, grade-based classes, which means 11th graders take classes with other 11th graders, 9th graders take classes with other 9th graders for the most part. The second is development of child labor laws and how this has affected the, different, the amount of time that adolescents spend with their peers versus with uh, adults or children. And third, we're going to look at some uh, basic demographic uh, changes, but most of this is stuff that we've covered before. Uh, we're going to look at how the baby boom has kind of led to more of a youth society. So the first one is the age grading in education. Um, and this is a relatively new phenomenon. Uh, so until about the 1930s, the more, most common way that uh, students were educated was in a one-room schoolhouse which basically meant you had multiple grades or multiple ages in one classroom. Um, in the Lakeland area, you can see some examples of these buildings still standing. Uh, you have the Mohegan Lake Schoolhouse, which is now Red Wing Shoes on Route 6, and on Locust Avenue on the other side of the district, you have the Little Red Schoolhouse, which are examples of a one-room or two-room schoolhouse model where you had a lot of different ch uh, children, different ages, all in the same classroom. Um, and even though in the 1930s there were some larger high schools and, and elementary schools in large cities, uh, the norm was still the one, the one uh, you know, the one-room schoolhouse. And what this meant is that students were not grouped by age so much, they were grouped by um, their ability levels, which means that if students were together, it was because more or less they were all learning the same thing. So that you might have a third grader who's learning reading, but you must, might also have someone who was at the age of a 10th grader also kind of doing introductory reading. And a lot of reasons for this is that a lot of people interrupted educations because they're working on the farm, uh, they went to school when they could, um, and you know sometimes that was infrequent, and therefore you had a lot of students in different age groups uh, mixing together in one classroom. Um, so two other things that kind of, um, and, you, and two other things that uh, kind of impacted this is that when you have, let's say, multiple age children in the same classroom, what you might see is a more peer mentor relationships, which means instead of being peers all on the same level, all learning the same things for the first time, uh, what you might see is more skilled students acting as like, uh, you know, substitute teachers, teaching, let's say, some students while the teacher was focused on maybe a different group. And so that you had kind of a very different relationship than the peer relationship where kind of everyone is an equal in their society. Um, you still see something of this in other education systems where um, you might see a system which is like you challenge a test, meaning that it's relatively easy to advance a grade or advance a subject once you felt you've mastered it. And what you wouldn't have, which you see much more in the United States, is that you have students who know the material um, and they'll stay in the same grade. And that skipping a grade happens here and there, but it's more of an unusual thing. So, for example, we have freshmen that are much more advanced than some seniors in su certain subjects. Um, but we don't let them like skip ahead to take those classes. Um, basically, we say, look, take this class. You're going to, you, since you know it already, you're going to do very well, um, and you're going to get a high grade. But we still want them to go through sequentially through the uh, the curriculum. Now, the new model is a grade-based education system, which is much more common um, in the United States, but has become more common throughout the world. And this means that you have schools that are like an elementary school, which is all these students of one age group, and a junior and senior high school dividing, let's say, uh, school-aged children into different, like, segments. Um, and so what's part of this is that we've tied curriculum is tied to age. And we talk about developmentally appropriate curriculum, which means we don't teach certain subjects at certain ages because we don't think the students are ready for it, even if they're actually cognitively or intellectually capable of doing the work. Um, and, uh, you know, we have, like, these curriculum maps where 
children progress sequentially through material and they have to, you know, kind of like building blocks where they start at one thing and then they build on that the next year and next year, next year. Um, which, what existed before that is that you might have um, challenged a test or gone ahead. So if you look at uh, what age students were going to college in the past, it would not be unusual to see 13 and 14 year olds going to college because more or less they had reached the same, the, the, the standard of the time for what a, a high school education was and they might have started college um, years early. Another thing that's kind of happened because of this is the issue of social promotion, which means that um, when you have a once room schoolhouse and you have lots of different students of different ages learning the same material, um, there's not as much of a stigma attached to the fact that maybe you're older than, let's say, the other uh, students in your classroom. But you see this very often today in schools where you might have a student who had an interrupted uh, education because of a move or a sickness, uh, you might have seen one student fail a subject and then therefore be held back. And even in my memory, um, it would be not unusual to hold the student back that they felt wasn't ready for more challenging material. Um, what's happened is that when you see social promotion, which means you allow a student who maybe is not master the material, uh, move forward with the other uh, students in their class because that's been their peer group and they've been kept together from kindergarten up to uh, 12th grade graduation. Um, and so some people have challenged is saying that you should kind of move ahead based upon your mastery of the material, but other people said this can be uh, social stigmatizing for students and it can also be uh, demeaning because they feel like so for some reason that they're not capable. Um, and lastly, what this, the reason for this is that what it's done is made your education group, your grade in school, uh, more or less your social group. And you kind of see this in high school dynamics where you know, seniors uh, talk down to freshmen and freshmen are more deferential, um, but that with, even within an age, there might be some type of hierarchy or pecking order. Um, this is kind of something that's relatively new. It's not something that would have happened as much in the past uh, because you might've had, let's say, um, a, a freshman who was well ahead of themselves or a senior who was kind of uh, a little bit slow and therefore you might've seen a lot more mixing or a lot less sensitivity to the age or to the grade of students um, but this has become a thing that has structured uh, the creation of peer groups. Um, and not, it's not saying that people don't have friends across grades and things of that sort. It's saying that most of your peers, most of your friends are mostly coming from the same grade. And that's a function of how um, education is organized. So the second thing is the uh, development of child labor laws. And this is a much longer process. Uh, in the 19th century, you would very commonly see uh, students graduate after eighth grade. Um, or start work even younger than that. Um, and then a series of laws have basically banned child labor or made it much more um, infrequent, at least before high, the high school age. So in the old model, children would graduate eighth grade or four, and they would uh, either become an apprentice or join the workforce as a manual laborer. And so what happened is most adolescents were not with their other peers. Um, they were probably the youngest person and they were more associating with adults and people were much older than them whether masters or other people in the workforce. And so what you might have seen is uh, uh, individuals the age of adolescence, meaning the high school years and early college years, um, basically treated as an adult or maybe as uh, junior members or mascots. But basically, most of their peer group were people who were significantly older than them. And as a result, that their peers were not kind of defined by people who are in the same age. You didn't graduate together and enter a uh, jo uh, job together. Uh, apprenticeship might be one or two at a time um, in different shops, but not, let's say, a whole, let's say, group of workers that have the same generational or same entertainment needs, which means your entertainment, your socializing, um, marriages, things of that sort, would have been a lot more varied than they are today. So the new model is that adolescents are in school with their peers, and this is not just true for high school, but also for the college age years. Um, and so who are the people you're most likely to in to, um, to, uh, to interact with are people th your same age. Uh, high school students mostly interact with other high school students, maybe a little bit older or younger on the side, same thing with college students. And therefore your reference groups are mostly gonna be people of the same age. Um, and that would not have been the case in the past where your reference group would have probably been um, a group of adult peers who you were working with and therefore socializing with and probably even, uh, you know, this is also before like drinking laws and things of that sort that you would have seen eighth graders or ninth grade uh, age individuals basically treated as adults or in a sense latching on to adult social life. 
Um, the other thing that's happened that's sort of uh, changed is that you have a two income household where not only is the father, but more commonly the mother is working and therefore there are more children at home without parents. So the point is that in the past you would have seen a lot of like adolescent and adult interaction and now you see a lot less, um, not just because children are not allowed to work and therefore they're being, you know, sequestered with uh, individuals at their own age, but they're also um, in the sense that their parents are not as home as much. And we talked a lot about that in our video lectures on the family. The last thing is demography. And as I said, this is something we've covered before, um, but it's something that I think is important, particularly in the United States, which is the baby boom. And so it's not just, let's say, that we're structuring differently, is that teens and adolescents have become such a, became such a large uh, segment of the overall population that people started to identify with them and there started to be a culture that developed around the teenage years. And this is really from about 1955 to about 1975. And so you saw a lot of changes in allocation of how society spent things on teenage services, meaning teenage music, education, uh, health care, youth sports, uh, growth of colleges, growth of high schools. And you also see businesses marketing to adolescent cohorts, meaning either portraying them as the avant-garde or the model held up or the glorification of youth, but also in a sense that uh, treating youth separate from the rest of the economy, which means that they were targeted as a, as a demographic separate from, let's say, their parents or from other children. Um, and so the, the size of the population um, helped crystallize a culture around that. And therefore, what happened is that a lot of media messages and cultural messages that um, adolescents were receiving kind of talked about them as a group and partly they were defined as a group from the outside. So adolescent peers, are they uh, good or bad? Uh, the con, you know, Many people said adolescents are separate from adult society, and this breaks down something we talked about in the culture video lecture, a breakdown in generational socialization, which means uh, culture is passed from one generation to the next, usually by some type of interaction with the older culture that sets the norms and expectations and creates the role models. And when adolescents are separated from adult society, um, they're not really receiving the same type of interaction, the same type of socialization process. And you might think of this as a vertical society breakdown. And what I mean by a vertical society is one that is where there's superiors and there's inferiors, whether it's based on age or uh, gender or um, occupational status, is that those on top are sources of authority and those who are um, lesser or junior in the relationship um, are deferent to that authority. And when you have a breakdown where there's not a clear, let's say, um, uh, high, uh, senior junior relationship, you might lead to an authority crisis because Everyone is making up their own rules. There's not, let's say, one norm or culture that governs the entire society. And you might have something of an authority crisis. On the other side, um, if you think of societies as changing and modernizing, um, horizontal groups become more important because um, they are kind of, let's say, a buffer or a source of affection um, that is independent of all the power relationships in a modern society. So in modern societies, you have things like uh, bureaucracies, you have things like uh, people are less likely to work for themselves or more likely to have a boss. And it's more important uh, in those types of situations to have people who are doing the same thing as you um, to let's say, well, is this normal or to provide affection or empathy towards you. And these peer groups are more important because they become an independent source of civil society. And so that adolescent peers are kind of a good process in the sense that they're building a horizontal society and what uh, Robert Putnam and others and James Coleman, who we'll talk about in the next slide, called social capital. And that high levels of social capital um, are a resource that people can draw on, which are these horizontal networks that we have with uh, similar people and um, similarly situated people. Um, now, um, I've mentioned this story before about when I worked uh, through the Care University um, and they, I worked at a school that had both um, American uh, students that came from the American educational system and students that came from the Japanese educational system. And they all went to Keio University, one of the more prestigious universities in Japan. Um, and generally, the, Jap the students that came from the Japanese educational system were academically uh, light years ahead of the ones that came out of the American system. And not surprisingly, they did better in classes, they got higher grades, etc. However, the opinion of the administrators at Keio University was that the American students, the students that came out of the American educational system, were really valuable because they were group formers, they had initiative, they uh, 
they were willing to be leaders. And they provide a lot of the social life that enriched the, uh, the college experience uh, for their peers, much more so than their, you know, their raw ability would indicate. So the negative view is generally associated with Samuel James Coleman, who has written, he's a very famous uh, sociologist. He coined the term social capital. Uh, he was a sociologist at the University of Chicago for many years. And one of his most influential books was called The Adolescent Society that came out in 1961. And what he said is basically that um, there is a society of adolescents that's independent of the larger society. Um, and this idea that children are no longer associating with their parents and therefore their motivation for academic success is lower because parents value school because they see it as a gateway into occupational status and occupational achievement. Um, but uh, most students' peers do not value school. So the idea is that you're getting conflicting message where the parents are emphasizing, hit the books, do well in school, and your peers will say like, you know, let's play and enjoy ourselves, listen to music, uh, emphasize on their social life. And so what the peer pressure, this is kind of the story that you've heard a lot of adults say, you know, the bad kid, the bad peer pressure is, is making you do things you wouldn't do and you're fundamentally a good kid, except that you're getting a lot of peer pressure from this adolescent society and there is a breakdown in parental authority. And James Coleman uh, basically said this leads to a lot more social dysfunction. You have higher teenage unemployment, teenage suicide rates growing up, juvenile delinquency was going up, substance abuse was going up, teen pregnancy rates were going up. And if you think about the time this is being written, we're moving from the 1950s into the 1960s and 70s, and all these things are rising. Now, whether they're arising because of a breakdown in uh, parent-adolescent uh, relationships and a growth of like adolescent society um, might have seemed to be connected back then because they were all changing, um, what they found over a longer period of time, and we covered this before, is that there's less adolescent parent conflict um, than you would then will be suggested by theories like this. Um, that you know, there might have been a generation gap in the 1960s and 70s, but for the most part, that generation gap has disappeared. Most teenagers agree with their parents. Uh, peer pressure is not necessarily uh, contrary to parental authority or parental judgment. Um, in many cases, it uh, supports it. Um, so when people study peer pressure, um, it really isn't a lot of peer pressure to use drugs. There's not a lot of peer pressure to, for underage sex, which means the reason why ki if kids are doing this, it's not because um, that their their friends are saying, here, here, use this, tra take this, you'll like this, or you know um, that they're oversexed, uh, um, and there's a lot of pressure in that sense. Um, generally, when kids are abusing drugs or they're sexually promiscuous in ways that are damaging to them it's because there's some other type of social dysfunction, probably because not so much that their adolescents, their peers are giving pressure on them, but their parents are absent or indifferent or indulgent, and it's a failure of parenting or a failure in the socioeconomics of their environment, and that's the reason why they're using drugs or they're engaging in promiscuous sex. Uh, the one example, exception to this is that there is, students do report some peer pressure to drink alcohol, but a lot of that's because I think that um, the taboo against alcohol is not as strong as drugs. Uh, a lot of adolescents see adults drinking alcohol and therefore they see it as something that's curious and interesting and not something that's taboo. And therefore they're more susceptible to the peer pressure, not because of the pressure put on by their peers so much as that they don't see um, an absolute prohibition coming from adult society. Um, you do see a little bit about that there's not a lot of pressure, peer pressure for academic success. Uh, but I think it's more to say that they're indifferent to it. So the point is that this is a very influential book. Um, there might be something to it. Uh, things could change, which make the claims in this book more true. But the current evidence in the current generation suggests that this is not as powerful as James Coleman suggested in 1961. Um, there's also an argument on the other thing that there's a need for peers, which means that uh, in traditional society, uh, you have very particularistic norms, which means every parent, every society, every village has different things that they think are good. Um, and therefore, every different parent conveys different norms, and those norms are passed down traditionally from one generation to the next. Uh, mostly because they're trying to keep a continuity over time, and therefore there's a lot of, let's say, um, older um, 
uh, adults make it very important that these norms are passed down, that these associations are passed down, that these identities are passed down. Um, and in a modern society, um, there's less of a tolerance for particularistic norms. And, and when you, you talk about this, we think of some example uh, exceptions that kind of convey some particularistic norms. So you have um, in Judaism, Hasidic uh, uh, societies, you have the Amish, uh, which have in some ways rejected a modern or universalistic norm. Um, and they have kind of their own set of norms govern the society. And so there's a lot more control um, and a lot more emphasis on passing down a certain set of values to their children. Um, but in a modern society, there's more universal norms, which means that everyone is governed by the same rules. Like right and wrong is not just right and wrong in one community, right and wrong is the same for all communities. Um, and because they're, so if you're learning things like tolerance and you're learning things like uh, um, liberty and equality, it might be more appropriate to learn these norms outside the family because the family is doing a lot of pressure to build like in-group connections. Um, but when you uh, are associating with a lot of different people, it's easier to generalize these norms beyond just your own experience and apply them to the world that we just don't have rights or privileges because of who we are, or what our identity is, but these are things that all people have. Um, and so the most efficient and effective way is to basically segregate people by age and kind of socialize them kind of mass in, ma in a mass production way um, and pass on these norms and have them interact with each other so they can kind of see, even though we're the same age group, um, there's a lot of diversity there and those universal norms will get transferred. So lastly, um, we're gonna talk about latchkey kids and latchkey children are those that are home alone after school, which means that starting really in the early, late 1970s, early 1980s, um, it became parent, uh, common as mothers be entered the workforce that kids were given a key and let themselves home, which means that they would be home for several, four or five hours after school, um, self-entertaining usually at this time with the television, watching a lot of TV, um, not having a lot of supervision or surveillance of their activities, and basically in some ways either raising themselves or with older children raising younger children. Um, so there was kind of this idea that uh, these children would be deficient because they're, they're separate from their uh, parental authority. Um, however, studies show that a latchkey child is not really different than their peers. Um, some, some studies suggest that they have a lot more personal responsibility because they have to make decisions that other children their age are not making. Um, however, there's some other research that indicates that latchkey kids are more isolated, uh, more socially isolated, which means they don't associate, they don't form friendships as much. Uh, mostly because they don't like invite their friends over and have a party. What they do is they basically uh, kind of collapse inward into themselves. Um, they might find their own interests or kind of in a sense uh, follow the beat of their own drum to an, um, an extreme degree. Uh, there's a, maybe a higher level of depression, more behavior problems, uh, substance abuse. And this might kind of fit in what we talked about different parenting styles and particularly the indifferent parenting style uh, leading to uh, problems uh, similar to this. Um, and the, the general consensus is that even though latchkey kids are maybe something that's uh, uh, something of the past, when parents are monitoring from a distance, i.e. Uh, they're phoning home or they're basically parenting uh, through their smartphone or you know, communicating with their child, that these teens are no more susceptible to um, negative outcomes, which means that whether the parent is physically present or whether they are kind of they give the child a phone and they call the child on the phone and they check up that more or less the outcomes are about the same. Um, and so there seems to be that the decrease in parental authority is not as important as previously thought. So that's it for this, um, this video lecture. On the next one, we'll get into more about the intergroup dynamics, meaning how clicks and uh, how these groups are um, interacting with each other. So like jocks and nerds and other kind of like self, uh, segregation into groups. And we'll talk more about that in the next video lecture. So that's it for now and have a good day.